Outside, should I run and hide? How do I take my company worldwide? Do you love the law? Did you watch Hee Haw? What's the weirdest thing that you ever saw? What's it like in court? Favorite sport? Can you help with my book report? Is my hair too long? Am I right or wrong? And do you mind if I sing along to anything? Ask Alan anything in the world. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of uh, Ask Alan, the podcast. I'm Alan Crone, the CEO of the Crone Law Firm, and um, we've got a very uh, special guest today. I'm uh, very lucky to have Morgan Bohanan on uh, on the show. He's with the Cumulus Radio Group. Um, so, Morgan, again, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Glad to be here. Uh, so, would you describe yourself as a radio man? Well, um, Oddly enough, uh, uh, you know, when I first got out of college, although I went to college to be a uh, broadcast journalism major, and when I got out, I went to work as a civilian employee for the Memphis Police Department, and I famously fingerprinted Al Green. Oh. And and then uh, <laughs> and then after that uh, brush with fame, uh, I ran into a guy named Bill Dodson, who used to be on WMC seventy nine with Aunt Eloise Cotton. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, back in the day, and uh, Bill and I became friends. And I always, being a broadcast journalism uh, major, uh, I always had an interest, obviously, in um, radio. Although it was more from a sports broadcasting perspective then. And he talked me into uh, giving it a shot, and I I got a job in uh, uh, the thriving metropolis of Clarksdale, Mississippi, at a thousand watt AM blowtorch, and. Um, met my wife, my future wife there. And uh, now here we are 35 years later. Well, very good. Very good. What, what attracted you to, to the, to radio? Well, I, like I say, originally I wanted to be a, a play by play guy, but I think the, you know, the, this industry is so, um, it's so high energy. If you are a person that doesn't like to sit around and, and, um, uh, be cooped up in an office uh, in, in a very structured environment. Uh, broadcast is is a place where you can uh, get away from that. So, um, how did uh, you go from Clarksdale to Memphis? Well, when I first got in the radio business, I was uh, pretty sure I was going to be the next Rick Dees, but it didn't work out. And um, one of my mentors in my career was a guy named Tom Reardon, who uh, was the manager of the station in um, Clarksdale. And Tom so told me something uh, uh, very significant uh, early on in my career there. I would do a show from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And then he, would, he slowly got me engaged in um, selling advertising. And he'd give me a package and he'd tell me to go talk to so-and-so at such and such. And, and I would go do it and then they would buy something. And then I would come back and <clears throat> write the commercial and produce the commercial and play it for them. And if they liked it, I ran it on my show the next day. So it kind of gave me this full circle education of the industry from top to bottom. And Tom one day said, you know, Morgan, um, a great radio station is really only as good as its sales staff. And to me, that was kind of a signal of, if you can't make it on the air, be good at selling it. So um, I kind of refocused my career on that. And I came back to Memphis as a salesperson uh, working for WREC uh, back in the day when uh, Sherry Sawyer was a sales manager and uh, Ott Roush was still on the radio. Wow. Okay. Uh, so why, why do you think radio is still um, a thing? I mean, you know, every, newspapers have kind of come and gone and um, television is changing, but radio seems to be, you know, right there in the middle of the fairway um, as a solid uh, medium. Yeah, no, I think it's about connection. I think it's about uh, personality. I think it's about, um, you know, being live and local and um, living down the street from the people that, very, that may very well listen to your show. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I, Memphis is very unique in that way. Uh, I, I've, 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 I've moved 13 times in 40 years. I've seen, um, 
all kinds of different marketplaces. And Memphis is so unique because most people that are born and raised here, quite frankly, never leave. And uh, if you grow up in the media business here um, as a radio or television personality, you become part of the family and kind of beloved. And, and quite frankly, Memphis is what would be considered a little bit under radio as a marketplace. There's not a, 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 a too big a variety of radio stations. There's really, you know, 10 or 12 real players in town. And most people listen to one of those 10 or 12. That's right. That's right. What is the biggest change you've seen in, in Memphis radio over the years? Um, you know, I guess the big public companies uh, buying radio stations and putting them all under one roof. You know, when, when I first started in this business, you had a standalone FM. You might have had a sister station AM. Uh, but, you know, if you were the general manager of that, you would, you would oversee those two stations. When, when deregulation hit in 97 and you were able to buy more than, at the, at the time when I first got in the business, you couldn't own more than seven radio stations in the country right now now you can own seven radio stations in memphis tennessee so that changed the landscape uh dramatically it brought a ton of efficiency from an operational perspective and it uh, guys like me actually enjoyed that because um if you have one radio station or two radio stations uh, uh, because of the way we're wired and the pace that we run you tend to kind of tinker in things uh, that may or may not be broken. If you've got four or five of those animals under the same roof, then something's always broken and, and you're always busy. You know what I mean? Right. But it also, I would imagine that also from a sales standpoint created a more flexible inventory um, because now you would have different kinds of demographics that you could appeal to. Sure. Those, those yeah. Stations. Yeah. No, all the, I mean, it's one of, it's one of the things that we talk about in our presentation to advertisers even now is that we can offer you diversity without duplication under this same roof. We have a station that appeals to African-Americans. We have a station that appeals to men. We have a station that appeals to women and we have a radio station that plays country music, which appeals to, uh, cradle to grave, no matter what, if you're country, you're country. It doesn't matter how old you are or where you live or whatever. So it's, it's unique in that way. Right. Right. Uh, which, uh, uh which stations in Memphis uh, are identified with uh, Cumulus? Well, we own Kix 106, the 35 year heritage country station, mm -hmm. um, 98 won the max, which is a, a rock property that, uh, has really uh, grown into being a legendary uh, station in the marketplace. WRBO um, 1035, which is the home of the hardest working man in show business, Steve Harvey. And, and then we also own um, 98.9 WKIM, we call it The Bridge, yes. uh, which, which is a, 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 a female driven uh, AC station. And um, where does, where does, where do those stations kind of uh, rank or compare with uh, uh, in the Memphis, in the Memphis market? Well, uh, you know, Kix 106 is the leading, uh, uh, country station in the market has been for 35 years. Um, uh, the max is the leading rock property in the marketplace. WRBO is the leading urban AC. And, uh, the only one that we don't have that's uh, top in its category is, uh, is 98.9 the bridge, but it's, it's, uh, it's an infant. Uh, in in its radio life, it's only been around for a couple of years, and it's growing, and we we have high hopes for it um, going forward. But uh, all three of our major brands are are leaders in their category. Very good. Um, over the years, I would imagine you've met and dealt with some of the more colorful uh, characters in Memphis radio. You got any? You got any good stories? <laughs> As you can tell, I don't. I don't know that there's anything that we should probably publicize. Um, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the part of what's so unique about Memphis is um, is the fact that we do have so many characters that have come through, um, and we have some legendary person. I mean, I, I mentioned Rick Dees earlier. You know, I mean, um, 
uh, I have a dear friend now, Craig Scott, who I, uh, I speak to probably more often than my brother. Craig was the general manager at WRAC and Rock 103 when I first went there in the in the mid 80s. And um, and and Craig and I uh, reminisce oftentimes about uh, the different personalities that have uh, have come through Memphis. But the interesting thing about Craig is that he was the he was running uh, RKO as a company back when um, Rick Dees was told, under no circumstances do you play that disco duck song on the radio station because we will fire you. And what did Rick Dees do? He played disco duck. <laughs> so they fired him. And then he went across town and uh, became a superstar. Right, right. Um, so have you been, uh, how about uh, some of the, the sports uh, casters we've had in town, you know, I'm thinking of, of Jack Eaton and George Lapidus and, uh, oh, yeah. you know, those guys um, kind of bigger, bigger than, than, than life in a lot of ways. Well, George, uh, 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 Jack, I, I never had much of a, a relationship with Jack Eaton, but everybody remembers great Scott and all of those famous sayings of his, but I had a, I had a pretty decent relationship with George and George was a, a, a unique guy, uh, very smart and uh, highly opinionated, which uh, obviously does well in the in the in the talk sports talk uh, arena. And um, I never forget when when we launched um, uh, Sports Fifty Six originally back in like nineteen ninety or nineteen ninety one, and um, we we were the flagship station. Kix 106 was the flagship station for the Tigers at the time. That was before Learfield Communications was ever involved. And um, we signed uh, Larry Finch to a coach's show. And uh, just to show you how creative our industry was, Larry's signing bonus uh, for uh, coming on with us to do his coach's show on Sports 56 was a mink coat for his wife. <laughs> Well, I got the job done, I bet. That's right. It did. It did. You know, you talk about Lapidus. George, it, it seemed to me, was really a pioneer. You know, back in those days, you were either a newspaper guy or a radio guy or a television guy or gal. Um, and you might go from one to the other, but you didn't do them all at the same time. George did before it was cool. Yeah. Everybody's doing that. Yeah, well, you know what George did was, and George was a master. Um, his motto of his show was always want, leave them wanting more. And with George's show, um, he always left you wanting more. He gave you a reason to tune in the next hour or the next segment or even tomorrow because he always left you wanting more. And um, that's a special gift. And, and George had it. He was, he was a phenomenal, I used to, I mean, look, I, I threw the press center back when I was a kid and he was a, he was a columnist in the press center and uh, made the transition to the commercial appeal. And then to all of the electronic uh, media they did over the years. I mean, the guy definitely pioneer is a good, good word for him. Right. Right. Um, where do you, where do you see radio going? Um, you know, you've got the satellite stuff and, uh, other internet based, you know, podcasts like this. Um, you think there's still going to be room for what has traditionally been radio or is it going to change too? I, I think, I think it probably has already changed and will probably even change more. I mean, um, you know, we, there, there's, there's more than one philosophy on how to run a railroad, so to speak. And we happen to be our company, Cumulus Media has, happens to be of the of the persuasion that live and local and connected wins. And so we've got more live local talent on our radio stations than, than anybody in town. And we think that's a, that we think that's a, a, a recipe for success. There are others that, that disagree with that, but what, what we're finding Alan is that um, audio as a whole, whether it be podcasting or radio or, um, music service or whatever audio as a whole is uh, has been a incredible companion for people for a long long time and it's even been accentuated during this pandemic it, it it's been rather amazing to watch how 
the listening audience figured out different ways to get their content. You know, our medium is king of the car. We want you in the car because we got you captive. Uh, well, nowadays you're not even captive in the car. You can you can pull up whatever you want on your phone and play it through a Bluetooth and off you go. But these uh, smart speakers at home have changed the environment, and it's also created opportunity for us because that's a that's a that's a totally different platform. It's monetized in a totally different way, and and gives us opportunity to kind of uh, broaden our footprint. And we're very we're very active in digital uh, advertising now with with uh, beyond uh, digital streaming and things of that nature. We're into display and email campaigns and, and all kinds of uh, targeted uh, digital uh, tools that uh, 15 years ago, we had no earthly idea even existed. Sure. Sure. Y'all are y'all doing um, companion podcasts for any of your personalities? We, we, we have some, uh, we haven't publicized any of them yet. Uh, Danny Bruns, who's my operations manager and, and probably one of the most creative people I've ever met in my life. She came up with this idea to, um, every Thursday afternoon, she gets to do it together with her entire air staff via a video connection like you and I are doing now. And, um, I think there's like a minimum two cocktail consumption before you get on and, <laughs> And everybody has to bring like two or three topics to the table and they sit around for about 30 to 45 minutes and talk about those things. And we've got about five or six of them in the can and uh, are, are about to release that uh, as a, as a, as a podcast product. And, and I think it's really unique. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I think that, um, that, you know, t uh, the, you, the internal combustion automobile uh, probably did more to save radio than anything else uh, over the years. Um, uh, but it's going to be interesting. I, you know, I, I was talking with Jeff Calkins last week, and we talked about newspapers, and newspapers really never figured out how to make that digital um, transition. And it looks like television and radio folks are figuring out a way to have both. And that seems to me to be the... the uh, the way well, and Jeff, Jeff is another perfect example of a guy that's diversified himself as a brand uh, into, into any variety of different mediums and increased the value of, of Jeff Cocken as a, uh, as a personality, you know? You know, psychologically, I don't know, I'd be interested in your perspective on this, but to me, there's a big difference between listening to a podcast that I know I can listen to anytime and catching something live on the radio, like, like Jeff's show or... Lapidus or someone like that, or even just listening to music that's, that has a, you know, DJ. Uh, do you think there's something to that? There is, there is. I mean, um, what we try to do is set appointments with our listeners uh, via the radio. And um, we try to be, we try to be predictable in some ways and unpredictable in others. Uh, uh, predictable from a timing perspective. If we have a particular feature that we know the audience enjoys. We try to do that feature at the same time um, on, on a daily basis or on an hourly basis or whatever the case may be. And then we spend a lot of time explaining to people when it's going to happen because our the attention span of the American consumer is uh, that of a gnat. And you have to you have to really be clear and specific about your instruction and intent if you expect it to have any result. How, how did the pandemic affect the radio business? You know, initially it freaked us out because we just weren't ready. I mean, um, when, you have, when you have four FM radio stations in a building that has um, somewhere around 20 personalities assigned across that landscape, and someone calls you one day and says, oh, because of this pandemic, you can't come to the radio station tomorrow. Um, we scrambled. Now, in a relatively short period of time with my engineering team and, and some good old fashioned ingenuity, we were able to, to get people on the air from their homes. Uh, and, and now I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to blow them out of the bedroom to get, <laughs> to get them back to the office. Uh, they've become very comfortable with it and, and, and highly productive. 
And uh, quite frankly, I think it's, um, you know, we, we've given our people some guidance and instruction on how to stay connected within themselves. Um, I've, I've got a, a one morning team that um, they keep a diary of the things that they do over the weekend and then they share that information uh, between the two of them on Sunday night, which gives them all this material to start the week off with. And most of it is just typical lifestyle things that you and I experience that they can bring some comedic value to. And nine times out of 10, if you're talking about things that the general public can identify with, they're going to, they're going to be fairly engaged with that content. Sure. How about from a revenue side? Um, was, was this, was the fact that you maybe had a bigger audience, was that good for business or did, was, was the economics of your advertisers driving down the demand for, for ads? Well, it's gone both ways. I mean, initially there was, uh, uh, complete and total panic. I mean, we saw uh, about 65% of our business disappear last April in the matter of, you know, 72 hours. Uh, people, people were just canceling everything. Um, it, as, the, as the calendar continued to roll on, uh, people diversified their message and um, developed niches uh, uh, that they could service uh, the general public in this environment. And things started growing back um, maybe about 20% a month or so. By the end of the year, we were getting close to um, semi-normal. Uh, first quarter for us was, was really quite good. And uh, second quarter for us right now is, 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 is on fire. I mean, we're, we're, we're pacing up, you know, 200% versus previous years. So things are, things are really good for us at the moment. Did, um, it, it, intuitively, I would think more people have been listening to radio over the last year. Am I right or wrong about that? It, well, it, it initially it dipped because everybody went home and being the king of the car, if you're not driving around, it's tough to get to them. Um, then people started slowly figuring out they could listen to our station uh, via our mobile app on their phone or via the internet on their computer or via their Alexa device or Google device or whatnot. And those things have started to grow. And, and, and we now see that um, some of that listening that was changed, some of those patterns that changed in the middle of the pandemic may very well become the new normal. Yeah, so. I, I probably listen to as much local radio I travel a bit, although last year I really haven't traveled that much. But I've real I've started using the apps so that I can hear my local radio shows no matter where I am. Mm -hmm. And um, you know that that has a uh, I don't know that's an intriguing possibility I think from a business standpoint going forward. Yeah. No. Well, here's the uh, you know the technology is pretty sophisticated. There are certain um, uh, software programs even today that uh, if you are in Los Angeles and you're listening to a Los Angeles radio station with your smartphone device, but that smartphone device has an IP address that's registered to Memphis, Tennessee, there's technology that would allow us to play a Memphis, Tennessee commercial wow. in the, in the Los Angeles content. So, um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty scary what we can do these days, uh, but it's, uh, uh, it, it, it just adds another layer of opportunity and connection for both advertisers and for us. Yeah, it, it, you know, you, you think about the scary nature of it, it on one hand, but on the other hand, you think, you know, it, I get better ads for me because of all of that than I did 10 years ago. Uh, right. You know, I, now, now the things that people advertise to me towards, I don't, you know, I'm really not very happy about. Uh, because I'm, I'm getting older, um, and uh, uh, my my dad uh, famously said to me, "What seems like every time I turn on the television, there's a funeral home ad. They're trying, somebody's trying to tell me something." And I said, well, "Don't listen to them." But but that is the that is the case. I mean, you know, it it, it oh, yeah. really is amazing how well you can target down to a specific person almost with your advertising. Oh yeah, no. Well, we have a product um, that's called people-based marketing, and and it can do exactly that. I mean, um, 
you paint the demographic and psychographic of the of the consumer that you want and we will find those people and advertise directly to them and of course that means that your potential roi on that campaign just goes through the roof because there's there's less waste and 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 you know you're hitting your target sure sure um what do you think you know, the, uh, back ahead. in the back, back in the day we used to say uh, uh we know 50 percent of our advertising is working we just don't know what 50 percent. well now we can tell you that's right that's right <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the digital stuff is just with geo, you know, targeting, geo fencing. Um, well, Alan, we have, we have technology now that if we get access to your Google, Google analytics as a, as a, as a, as a company, we can run a commercial on the radio and measure your Google analytics within 10 minutes of when that commercial ran and tell you tomorrow morning, how many people went to your website based on the content of that commercial. That's great. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. That's, 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 that is, it is amazing. I mean, uh, I remember when I first started getting, you know, uh, opened my own firm. Uh, uh, I never heard that, that, that axiom before, but it certainly is true. You know, you just felt like we're just throwing stuff out, you know, off the top of the, the, uh, sure. the roof and we're just hoping somebody catches it. Right. Those days uh, are gone. So those days are gone. And, you know, uh, uh, but you know, you still, we still in Memphis don't have any, um, shortage of uh, radio personalities and characters. And, uh, I hope that continues for a while. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at that Ron Olson guy. He's 127 years old and he's still on the radio. Uh, I, I remember, you know, I, I, <laughs> Ron is a friend. I hate. I almost. I sometimes I call him the the Fred Cook of our generation. Um, you know that uh, he's just the people who grew up with him are going to be loyal to him for forever. And that's what that's what it was with with Fred. You know, I remember when I was in my twenties. You know, you listen to Fred, and Fred's playing. You know, all these these the things that were popular when he was a young man. Uh, but that was his audience, and his audience was was loyal to him. And I think it's the same thing with. With Ron, although Ron has been able to stay relevant um, beyond just his his own age demographic, at least that's my perception. Yeah, well, no, Ron is like a lot of uh, homegrown uh, Memphis radio personalities. Is that you know, the, it, as long as you stay true to yourself and and just be who you are on the radio. I mean, Ron Olson back in the day used to say he was the son of Mister and Mrs. Olson, and mm -hmm. that's what he was. Yeah. And that's and that's what he is today, and and uh, you know as long as he keeps that perspective, uh, he'll be able to make it another year. Well, you're a you're a lifelong Memphian, um, and you've been you've lived in other places. What do you what do you think's the the biggest change in Memphis over over the years that you've seen? Oh well, uh, you know the. The biggest change, I think, in Memphis is the lack of change to some degree. And by that, I say this. Um, you know, we are so fortunate. We have uh, the, the – are you familiar with the Society of Entrepreneurs? Absolutely, yes. They, 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 they put out a book a few years ago called There's Something in the Water. Mm -hmm. And I believe there's something in the water. I mean, you think about – uh, the things and the innovation that have come out of Memphis, Tennessee, that but some of which became worldwide, incredibly famous brands. Mm -hmm. And, um, and they were started by Memphis based families and entrepreneurs. And now we have the third generation of many of those family families continuing on with with that business. And I challenge anybody to find another place in America where that's true. I mean, you take just a perfect example, um, the Carlisles and what they're doing with uh, with with the hotel space downtown. Mm -hmm. uh, cheap uh, uh, internal plug. My my daughter works for Hyatt and she works at the uh, Hyatt Center Hotel. But anyway, um, which is a, those, if you haven't been. It's a great property. It's it's phenomenal. I mean, it's it is it is so far above what you would typically see in Memphis, Tennessee, that you're just astounded. And that rooftop down there is priceless. You can see that broken bridge all the way. <laughs> it was but, in a crack. That's right. But but those guys, uh, they could have built that hotel anywhere they wanted to. 
but because of who they are and where they're from, they built it in Memphis, Tennessee. And I think that is what makes Memphis so special. You have the Dobbs family, the Wilson family, uh, uh, any number, the Loeb's, uh, just a huge variety of people that are native to Memphis that have the economic choice to do whatever they want to with their life, but they choose to be here. And, and I think that, I think that makes us special. I think you're right. Uh, and I think there is something in the water. I don't, and I think it has a lot to do with the water. I think it has a lot to do with the river um, and our heritage as a river town where people came and gone, you know, would come and go. And um, I think it's more of a metocracy in Memphis than in a lot of other Southern cities in particular. You come to Memphis with a good idea, with a heart and willing to work hard. The community is willing to accept you, uh, even if you didn't go, grow up here. And music is a big part of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, our, our, our history and heritage in the music industry alone is something that uh, most cities across America are envious of. That's right. You know, I, I, I worked for the, for the mayor for four years, uh, Mayor Strickland, and uh, uh, somebody told him we, we first got into office, he said, they said to him, you will never get, not get a return phone call says you can call anybody, any mover, any shaker in the world and say that you're the mayor of Memphis and you will get a return phone call. And that's not true of every American city. But right. Memphis has this mystique all around the world, whether it's whether it's uh, because of Elvis or B.B. Uh, King or W.C. Handy or um, just, you know, Kimmons Wilson or whoever it might be. Um, it's just got a mystique around the world that people want to be associated with Memphis. Sure, no doubt. I mean, our history in soul music is so deep and um, so lasting. I mean, it's hard to believe that um, I'm, I went to Messick as a as a child, and my mom and dad both graduated from Messick. Well, uh, Duff Dunn, uh, Steve Cropper, and any number of other really talented musicians grew up in that neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Then you go across town to Booker T. Washington and and you've got, uh, you know, uh, for the most part, Earth, Wind and Fire wouldn't be if it weren't for BTW and and uh, Booker T. and the MGs would have never happened. So, so yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, my my ringtone for years was green onions. And when I would live in the when I'd live in the Carolinas, uh, I'd be in Charlotte, North Carolina and my phone ring. And probably seven out of 10 people knew that song. Well, that's, that's pretty amazing. It didn't have any words and it was three and a half minutes long, but right. everybody, everybody in the world, regardless of their age, seemed to know that's Green Onions, but Booker T and the MGs from Stacks. That's, that's, that's pretty strong. Well, and you know, that universality is a big part of um, your industry really has a lot to do with that. The fact that music is so ubiquitous in our life is really because of radio. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's uh, the ultimate mood center. No doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I used to uh, call my friend, David Porter. I'd be uh, at Keough Island, South Carolina, uh, and, and uh, there'd be a band playing at a Friday night event and they'd start playing soul man. And I would call David <laughs> and say, you want, you want me to get 20 bucks from him? <laughs> my, uh, <laughs> My only claim to fame musically is when I was in college, our fraternity had a couch sofa that reportedly had once belonged to uh, uh, Duck Dunn. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, that was as close as I got to the big time. <laughs> and I, I'm not, I'm probably not real uh, sure how, cl- how close I really came and want to know how close I came to the big time. But uh, that's a, that's another show. <laughs> well, Morgan, I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, Absolutely. It's been great talking with you. And uh, anybody needs uh, to promote their business, uh, radio is the way to go. It's a, it's a great value, and it's very, very effective. And I'm sure if you give Morgan a call, he can hook you up. You can shoot me an email at morgan.bohannon.com uh, at uh, cumulus.com. And uh, around the plant, we like to say we doze but never close. There you go. There you go. 
Well, thank you. And if uh, thank you everybody for listening. And if you've enjoyed this uh, show, and you know what, who are we kidding? Of course you enjoyed it. It was fascinating. Um, Morgan was a great guest. Please share us on social media. Email it to a friend. Um, maybe email it to somebody who may be thinking about a career in radio and see how it's done. Um, this is Alan Crone, the CEO of the Crone Law Firm. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go get some justice, and and Morgan is go gonna go out and sell some air. So we'll see y'all later. Thank you. Thanks, Alan.